Well, for those of you who are just walking in, uh, welcome to the Maker Fair Speaker Program. My name is Stuart Gaines. I'm with Make Magazine. And uh, today we just have a really wonderful procession of interesting people. And as you spend your day here at Maker Fair, I would just encourage you to, you know, wander out, enjoy the fair, come back for speakers who you think might be interesting. Uh, there's no real set or pattern for doing anything here, just to enjoy what moves you. Uh, but I'm glad you're here. Yes? Uh, one question. I've heard rumors that uh, the Henry Ford decided to buy your contract between Maker Fair and Uber uh, I haven't heard those rumors. Uh, we would be delighted if that turned out to be the case, uh, speaking personally, but I have not heard that um, yet. We've been talking earlier about the, the inspiration for making an innovation, and uh, uh, we had this uh, interesting uh, and really compelling uh, example of the developing world appropriate technology. Uh, another source of inspiration are people themselves, understanding how technology interacts with us as human beings. And uh, John is a professor at the University of Michigan. He's doing some really exciting work uh, with robots, and um, uh, his, his his presentation is called Making an Interactive Environment Tea Room for Robots. So I'd like to welcome John to make a fair. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I have a wee bit of an accent. I'm originally from Scotland, so if you don't understand what I'm saying, um, I apologize for that. Uh, sometimes I pronounce words a little bit strangely. Uh, but uh, as we said, I'm a professor at the uh, University of Michigan. I teach in the School of Art and Design and also the Tubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Uh, I teach this class called Smart Surfaces where we have uh, art design students, we have uh, material science engineers, and we also have architects all working together and trying to build, and um, last year it was heliotropic smart surfaces, so solar energy uh, panels that don't look like black, flat, shiny things. And this year we're going to be doing biomimetic smart surfaces, so um, a good example of what that might be is if you think of a lotus leaf, um, which has all these little bumps and things on it that make it self-cleaning. So um, those would be examples we'd be looking at. Uh, in my own art practice, I don't uh, do the whole um, in, a, in a studio on my own, um, you know, painting type of thing. I'm not that kind of artist. I still work collaboratively. Um, when I collaborate and I, a practice is called Root of Two, and I work with Cesar and Charles, who's in the audience somewhere. But um, we call ourselves a hybrid art and design practice because we do stuff that um, might look like product design, we also do stuff that might be more like sculpture and stuff in between. And a lot of the time we're looking at how uh, technology uh, comes together with people and how those inter interactions happen. So this particular project, we also work with um, an architecture firm, uh, so Carl Dorman is the principal of this, Ply Architecture, which is in Ann Arbor. Carl is also a professor at Tottenham College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Uh, and uh, Root of Toon and uh, Ply have collaborated on the three projects. And uh, we also uh, hired as uh, interns uh, Wesley Berger and Chris Johnson, who were previous smart surface students. So we brought them on board to try and help us get this project made. Um, to tell you a little bit about the setup of the project, this is currently on uh, exhibit at the moment in Japan, in Kyoto, at the Museum of Modern Art. And the show, uh, as you can read, is Trouble in Paradise, uh, Meditation or Mediation of Survival. And what it was, was this, a theme of the show is like all the uh, issues that uh, human beings uh, face in the 21st century. You know, so issues of like, um, and science and technology and like space and all these challenges, you know, so climate change is the big one. Uh, but what we thought was, um, is there another way of dealing with some of these issues rather than the typical sort of like, we're all going to die, isn't it horrible type of way. So uh, thinking about, you know, what is a, uh, a way of approaching some of these problems uh, in a way which is uh, more positive and potentially fun. So we built a tea house for robots. Uh, so you can see here that there's the, uh, the three robots that live in the tea house. Um, these are early renderings, so these are computer uh, generated uh, images. And um, I'll talk through the process of actually making the, uh, the robots in the tea house. But um, 
you'll notice straight off the bat that they're kind of cute. And um, this is intentional. What we are thinking is, um, you know, how do people respond to objects and how can we use that behavior? How can we use that response to try and change people, the way people think about uh, sustainability? And you know, how can we change the way we uh, interact or use products? And the robots and the tea hats all have names, which are sort of like, you know, one's a toaster, sort of TST. Um, and this is like looking at a lot of Japanese products, they all have serial numbers for our own names, so that's kind of a play on that. Okay, so one of the big influences on this project was um, this book, um, Emotionally Durable Design. And this is by a, a, a British um, writer and critic, um, uh, Jonathan Chapman. And what his idea is, is if, uh, if our products were more like teddy bears, then um, they're less likely to end up in landfill. Ages as you build up a relationship over time, maybe it gets a little bit worn in spots. Maybe it, um, uh, you know, maybe it's eye falls out, or its nose comes unstitched, or whatever. You know, you love it all the more. And the idea is, well, okay, if we made products the way we make teddy bears, then maybe uh, they won't end up in as waste and go into the environment. Uh, so we took that idea and we thought, okay, that. So how do we deal with an emotional response between people? and objects, and how can we play on that to try and um, highlight, you know, the behavior, and do it in a fun, and, um, you know, as a way of responding where like, get an immediate response rather than maybe thinking about it, but as you go away and leave the exhibit, you know, you think on it, you play on it, you, you know, you build up a, um, a, a visceral or a desire and response to the object. Okay, so, so one of the things we did in this fantastic game here in Henry Ford, um, Dymaxion houses here, and we've got a Dymaxion car by Buckminster Fuller here. So the conception for these uh, robots was that um, we would draw on iconic uh, industrial era products. So you've got an Airstream trailer, uh, a dual leaf toaster, you've got a GM Future Liner, a uh, Bush radio, and a Dymaxion car and a KitchenAid mixer. You know, these are really hard, shiny, uh, automotive era technology, you know, and, and they have a really striking presence, and I think that um, most of us respond well to them. I mean, uh, contemporary technology, like the, our cell phone, for example, you know, it's, it's kind of a rectangle, it might have some curved edges, you know, and it's, you can't really say that you um, have an emotional response to a form. You know, what that does for you, the function and the connection it has with other people, might um, provide that more emotional type of response, but the thing is the form itself wasn't. So this, this, was, this was the sort of starting point for conceiving the robots. So the KitchenAid was kind of straight off the bat, you know, the KitchenAid makes it on wheels and basically done, you know. Um, it's, it's got this uh, cute sort of home look and feel. But the, the other two, this was on early collages of trying to um, morph these things together and look at them and, uh, you know, you know, put wheels on them, put tank tracks on them, you know, looking for a kind of funky response, I guess. Uh, then, so I'm developing that idea for them, and working on you know, the computer, uh, you know, building early computer models, you know, to try and work out, you know, where these things want to go, can we put wheels on them, where can we put more, or where can this go? And also just to have something to visualize, you know, as you're communicating with people, and, uh, this whole process of development this exhibit took uh, 18 months and the whole time we were in touch with the people in Japan so trying to um, have them understand you know what a tea house for robots might be you know was quite a lengthy discussion especially when I speak no Japanese um, so then the idea of like sketching you know so uh, a marker drawing of like what toaster on tank packs might be how much space is needed in there and then sketching both in the in the computer in the sense of making drawings, making models, and also building physical models. And I think this is really important. Um, uh, I think it's something that's the core of me, and I think it's something that I, in my, uh, also in my practice as an educator and you know, in school, this is something I try to impart on my students, is, um, you know, um, making is important. You know, I think um, a lot of the time, when, especially when computers are involved, you know, people tend to think you press a button and you're done, you know, the hand has disappeared from practice. And, and I believe in craft and I believe in um, you know, hands-on making. I think um, a lot of the time I think with my hands, I'm standing up here waving my arms around and on, and it's like I can't communicate without using my hands, you know, and you know, I, I can't do what I do without using my hands. 
So even though I use the computer a lot, um, you know, actually touching physical stuff and what we're doing on things is really important. And uh, so the development of, of like a physical computer and open source hardware, uh, I think is a uh, you know, huge boon. Uh, I mean, I would never have conceived that I would be building robots and programming microcontrollers and doing all this stuff uh, until basically uh, I discovered the Arduino. And I think that's the case for a lot of people, the Arduino microcontroller. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a programmer. I don't have that hard engineering background. You know, I mean, I study fine art, you know, and uh, I spent time working with architects and theater companies and, you know, being a sort of jack of all trades and made stuff, you know. Um, that's really the core of my practice. So being able to um, put together something that will respond to the sensor or whatever. And you can see here, I mean, it's a uh, mechano, uh, it's a construction toy. Uh, you know, there's also the X robotic stuff. So this is off the shirt shop stuff. Like having things that are to hand, you know, so lots of electrical tape and string and whatever around, you know, to, to actually have something physical that they can respond to. That's a big part of um, our practice and what we're doing, how, how we do this. It's a way of thinking, thinking through making. So then going back to the forwards, iteratively, like, you know, doing something physically and uh, getting some response from what the object is, seeing how things are together, and then going back into the computer with what you learn. You know, maybe doing a more polished rendering or a version of how can you fit all these things together? You know, this sort of level of detail. You know, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time. You've got an idea and you're going to try it out and put it in whatever. And I spent five, five years working on product development. And this process is essentially no different. You know, whether you're working with uh, engineers with millions of dollars budget or whether you're, you know, tinkering away in a studio trying to make a robot throw stuff that can take to Japan. I mean, the process is the same. You know, the actual phases of the um, development. But the thing is, you know, maybe the budgets are different, maybe the access to the equipment is different. But um, I think that um, a lot of the stuff we see here in Maker Fair is making that more accessible and certainly more affordable. Okay, so uh, looking at some of how these things um, develop in terms of the way they look, um, you know, coming from an early rendering, which is, you know, purely computer. You know, looking at, well, okay, I built a prototype of the chassis that would go inside the motor, so I need to make it thicker, I need to make it wider, you know, I need to fit stuff in, you know, and a change in color choice going from the original red to keeping the red accent to going yellow. One of the things was developing the personality of the robot that became really annoying but cute. So what's really annoying and cute was Tweety Bird. Um, so the uh, robot in the radio became yellow, and it's actually literally the same color as Tweety Bird. Um, and then in the original computer model, you know, you just uh, you have a shape, but then you've got to think of how you're going to make that. So there's um, the scenes, you've got to uh, look how these things are going to fit together. So it changes the shape. So again, it's this iterative process where you, you do something, you know, and it, you begin having a conversation. And you begin, the object begins to talk to you. Okay, so once you're developed and everybody's happy about how the thing works and whatever, you come to well, how am I going to make it? Obviously, the make is kind of why we're all here. So, um, thinking, okay, I need the basic shape. So, it's actually kind of working backwards. So, you've kind of done some of the detailed design, some of the, you've finished some of the things like the nubbin on the, the kitchen aid, you know, the dials and these kind of things done. That. You just strip all those back off and go back to the basic shape. And this is how this was made with you know, CNC, a pure medical control milling machine. So, uh, taking a block of um, uh, fiber board and uh, milling out that shape. So you end up with uh, the top uh, right, uh, these blocks that have bits in and trimmed up and need to sand. And, and again, this comes back to the, the whole model point of what the use of the hand, although this is being technically fabricated, you know, it's a very 21st century process. You know, I mean, it's like sitting there for two days solid, you know, with, with pieces of sandpaper rubbing on these things. Um, you know, the, the handwork is really what makes the distinction in this kind of work. I think, you know, I've seen lots of student projects, I've seen lots of professional projects where you can see the, the, the lines, the layers of the fabrication process. You know, and like, um, you know, the difference between like that kind of prototype and uh, something that someone would accept as a, a finished industrially produced object, you know, finish it like you. So uh, once the blocks are um, formed, uh, plastic resin glue is going to be on them, and then they're polished out so you get a really slick, shiny 
surface, which is where you look at a vacuum form. So then the, the shells are the vacuum form. So this is using ABS plastic and that. That's kind of important um, uh, because of some of the other processes that you're going to use is doing that. So this is using like an oven to so bake this sheet of plastic, um, put it over the form and then uh, the base of the um, uh, platform has um, a vacuum probe in it so that the plastic gets sucked down as tight as possible onto the form. And then you've got your shape there, uh, which can be trimmed up, and then you've got basic, you know, that you can start fitting and cutting all the way together. The reason I use an ABS is because um, it dissolves in acetone, and you've got to wear gloves and ventilate the room and whatever. But, and one of the things is you can take a piece of scrap and uh, with a deburring tool, which is a red thing in the photo here, and you can actually shave off these sort of like hairs and tendrils of what like, um, ABS, which dissolve in acetone. And I think this is um, probably one of my favourite parts of this project was um, the fact that I, I was also working with an FDM, which is a huge deposition modeling machine, which also uses um, uh, ABS thread. So it builds up a three dimensional part by almost weaving a hot ABS thread. So the thing is, the fact that both parts were made of ABS and they dissolved in acetone, you can actually make up a paste which you can paint on. And essentially, it, it, once once the uh, it's set up, it's it's not like using glue or um, a bonding compound or something. It's actually it's literally a solid piece of ABS again. So that's um, that's one of the things I'm, I'm kind of happy with is the fact that I'm be able to take this digitally fabricated part and this handmade part and put them together and like essentially there's no there's no difference between them. It's got the same same amount of flex, it's got the same amount of um, essentially the same thing as material. Um, so you see that we are so this is um, you know putting the speaker grill or the mark speaker grill into the radio because it's essentially a set of undercuts that you couldn't do um, uh, by the vacuum form and stretching the sheet the sheet of plastic over, you know, if you've got something that has a step in it, you know, you can't pull that back off, so this was a solution to having that detail. And uh, using a, a demo, a rotary cutting tool and a scalpel to actually make a hold in it, again, comes back down to, you know, the digital process, the hands-on process, and somehow uh, bringing those two things together. Um, so, um, putting in all the details about how these things would fit together. I mean, in an industry, you know, this would all be done, you know, Tools created, you can see that in the museum, you can see examples of tools like in human's chairs, these big steel forms. You know, we don't have access to that kind of technology, so we've got to see you know, how we can do this. You know, so a lot of hand work, uh, carefully cutting out ribs and fitting them in and putting them together, and joining all these parts together. Uh, making handles, also I'm getting like little jigs and fixtures so that you can put together. And you can see the uh, got the basic chassis of the toaster done. You can see the picture on the top left, the, you know, the toaster robot with the, you know, the original inspiration of the dual like toaster, so we'll compare the two. But then looking at, okay, how do you make it function? You know, so you can see probably in the image the you know, carbon you know, masking tape. Uh, a lot of my students, you know, they want to go straight to, all they want to use curly because they want to cast them brown, they want to work on aluminum, and it's like, no, no. Uh, curl and uh, masking tape is fantastic. You can work out all the issues with that. You can do it fit, fast. You know, generically, the whole digital fabrication is rapid prototyping. So this is this is fast, down and dirty prototyping. And to find out and work out um, all the uh, all the bugs and all the issues, and to be able to do that um, is, is an important part of the process. I think. So. First carbon masking tape, and then to the computer, and then finally to the ABS. So that's actually using the FDM to print, uh, to, you know, weave this ABS thread, which I, I didn't realize, but the toaster was going to light up when it toasts. Um, uh, one of the things that discovered was the FDM is because it's colorless, it actually transmits um, the light. So it might not be appropriate for this project, but for a future project, that's, that's further away, you know, the ABS there. Um, electronics um, is basically it's just a work in progress, um, sketching and hardware, uh, using Arduino motors. Um, we've only been working with that stuff for a couple of years now. Um, I never thought I would do it. Um, it's not something that is uh, native to me. It's a learning curve. It doesn't come, the, the whole logical structure is not how my brain works. 
but I can I can get there, I can work through them. There's always plenty of people around and there's information online that can help. Um, I won't dwell too much on that because um, it's, I tend to work visually, there's no bullet points in my presentation, you know, it's all images and hand waving. So um, talking about the code in terms of images and hand waving doesn't make any sense. So if you want to ask me about it later, I'm more than happy to talk about it. Okay, so other robots, um, the radio, the kitchen mixer, and the toaster, ready for paint, and then painted. Um, we went to a local collision detail place um, to paint them for them, which was great. So again, playing up the whole idea of the cuteness, so we're using an ultrasonic sensor, the pain sensor, um, you know, which is the way the robot finds its way around, but, you know, it looks like a bit of eyes. So playing on that, more drawing the things that you know, have eyes or faces and look happy or whatever. So how do we can bring the, the interaction back to the uh, audience, you know, get over that um, sort of like setup or the thought process where you have a woo response, which is really what we're looking for in the radio. So each of the robots have different behaviors and different interactions. So the, the, the radio, when it, when it sees you, it plays samples from old science fiction movies and so forth. It's got quite an attitude, so it's things like the uh, uh, biological entity, you know, you for your in fever, which is from an 1950 movie, so things like that. So it's kind of cheeky. Okay, and the tea house, the development. The development process for the tea house was almost parallel. Uh, same thing, so initial sketches and concept drawings and stuff on the computer. Um, so these were earlier uh, versions of look at this sort of um, uh, uh, linear system. And what it is, is this is all done with scripting, so um, you can set some parameters like the, the, the voids in the surface, the holes. You start talking about those as eyes. You know, that, was, that was the language we started developing and talking about. You know, so we wanted the eyes to open uh, to reveal the robots inside. You know, so things like you know, setting in the, in the code, how to set the eyes, how to set the height, the, the dimensions of the tea house are based on um, actual Japanese tea house, which is actually quite a restrictive thing. It's nine feet by nine feet by six feet tall. So that's all worked through uh, some of the parameters of the, 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 the tea house as well. And then, but again, go from the computer, go from the concept to the actual hands-on. We get it and make some of these things. And so, um, the material was actually, it's a completely synthetic paper, which is 100% recyclable. Um, it's actually used for book covers. So we get the sheets and this laser cut. And uh, one of the things was that we discovered that um, with the humidity, and it was going to be monsoon season in Japan. So that was a big issue, was that having these flat strips would actually uh, cause buckling to happen. And it you know, wouldn't look as finished as we wanted. So the idea was then to have this double system, to have these two walls that are interwoven, and that way it gives itself some structure and it would actually hold itself uh, more rigid. But we still wanted to be you know, empty paper and to actually get it to Japan to get to roll up and ship it. So this is the mechanism, this is all what the, um, it's essentially a bunch of tabs that hold all this thing together. The sheets of paper are about this size, so, um, you know, it's done in pieces like this and then they're all, you know, tabbed together and folded together. Uh, and a lot of work, a lot of hand on a lot of nitpicky stuff. Um, but you can see how these things go together. They go together as units and then go together as um, uh, lots of sections and then that all uh, weaves together. And this is it in the process. And the, the paper has a translucent quality, it lets the light come through it. So um, it starts looking really interesting, you know, because you get this gas uh, as you move through the surface. And then it has all made out and rolled up, ready to ship. And then that goes on to a structure, which is um, it's actually a CNC cut and uh, plywood. Um, and then there's the operable panels, which are the eyes, which I'll talk about a little bit in a little while. And then on the inside, the robots actually live on these. The idea was like counters, you can live on kitchen counters, and this is, this is kind of how you know what depending on what the movement and the reaction of the robot specifically is. So yeah, it is actually uh, in, under construction. One of the things was we had to build this here in Michigan and then um, ship it. So we had to debug and try and get it working. You can see that the eye works. It's kind of like a uh, Venetian blind, graphical Venetian blind, uh, with a couple of little servo motors that would respond. 
And the idea was, what we wanted, this tea house of the future, which is kind of like where your robots would go to recharge and to um, uh, update themselves in you know, the way that you, you, you update your laptop. So the products of the future would um, go to a place in the house with solar energy well, you know, with the surface. You know, but the thing is, if you wanted to interrupt them, if you wanted to disturb them, then you have to be kind of friendly, you have to be happy. So the idea was that the eyes should open only if you smile with the tea house. So here's the uh, actual idea. You know, so 25% smile, you know, opens the eye a little. More of a smile, opens it a little further, and then all the way. So um, here's the tea house size with milk, and then lift. And then shipping to the Japan, unpacking it, rebuilding it in Japan. And then the system we use to make the, the, the eyes open is actually, it's actually a propriety system. It's the only thing about the project that isn't in, uh, in the public domain. And what it was was that by this uh, medical and industrial sensor company in London, they have this smile scan. And we were actually invited to use this project, this, this piece of technology. But the only thing was it wasn't allowed to leave Japan. So the first time we actually got our hands on it was when we actually arrived there. So we had about three or four days to actually rebuild the piece, so it was kind of stressful and um, working through trying to integrate the tea house system, the robots, and the smile scan. Essentially, what it does is it takes a, a, an image from the video camera and it will track, it will discover and track up to two faces. And then, based on uh, how much those faces are smiling, and this has been done over a million people, like uh, tracking points. And you have a whole database that it compares things to it. And it happens almost instantaneously. In the image with a laptop, and a little black box on the back of the table, that's the actual smile scan. Uh, so we had to work out how to get that to talk to an Arduino. Um, and we had to help us with a programmer. And we helped us do that. But um, essentially, what happens is in the museum as you're walking past, if you hunt and you smile, and, or if you're looking at the tea house and you see the robot and you smile, then the eyes open. And uh, the robot can then see you. So we're looking for interaction between people and the tea house, uh, the tea house and the robots, the robots and the tea house, the robots and people. So we've got this complicated uh, set of interactions. Now you can see some Japanese people um, having a look at the museum. So when the uh, uh, radio sees you, it plays sound, and uh, the rest of the time it scuffles around like a clip crab. The toaster wanders around on the platform. The black line you can see on the top right there actually has sensors, and basically that's how it knows the edges there. So it will back up and turn when it sees. All the robots are completely autonomous, so they're actually in and doing their own thing. The mixer, we figured that um, a mixer, uh, when you use it in the kitchen, it just spins in one direction. So if it had its own time to play, then it would spin every which way. So the mixer spins around all over the place, um, which is kind of crazy, but we think it's fun. And then there's the view from behind. So if you remember the original um, rendering, we had a sort of concept of the image to show what these things were going to be, but just the actual thing. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them.